headlines for obvious reasons are the ones that, that are the rarest and the most shocking. Crimes against the elderly are a case in point. Attacks on elderly people are extremely rare, particularly in their own homes, although the publicity they receive can lead us to think they are more commonplace than they really are. But it's even more rare for an old person to be attacked without any conceivable motive. But this seems to be what has happened in our next case. Fred Maltby was in his 70s. A quiet man, he'd always lived on his own near Lincoln, farming his small plot of land. Nine weeks ago, sometime during the evening of Tuesday, October the 1st, Fred was murdered in his living room. Our film begins near the city of Lincoln. For the past 40 years, Fred Maltby had lived here in this farm cottage in Brant Road on the outskirts of the city. Fred seldom went far afield, and when he did go out, he'd use the back door, leaving it unlocked behind him. An early riser, he was always one of the first customers at the village store across the road. Morning, Linda. Morning, Fred. Come for your bread. That's right. Is it fresh in? It is. Good. I'll take the usual five for you. Fred was quiet, kept himself to himself. He was always cheery. Do anything for anybody if they asked him. He used to come in first thing in the morning, pick up his bread and milk, then probably come over later on in the day. He never was the sort of man to do things all at once. He'd come over for little bits and pieces. Fred used some of his 15-acre small holding to grow a variety of vegetables, which he sold from the shed next to the house. He rented the rest to local people for grazing horses and cattle. During the property boom of 1988, some developers offered Fred £500,000 for his land. That offer was quickly withdrawn once the boom became a slump, but it is possible that someone thought Fred was better off than he really was. One of Fred's oldest friends was Bill Lockley, who runs the garage next door. Fred himself was a skilled mechanic, and he'd often drop by for long chats. Well, I, I think I've known Fred for about 25 years. It's well, getting on a bit there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I suppose it is, yeah. He used to come very often to the garage. We used to talk about things, and he used to uh, come for spares and, uh, and repairs to his cars, tractor parts. I shouldn't have thought he had a lot of money myself, because he never spent a lot of money. I don't know, he lived in a, a poor way, I suppose. As you say, you can't keep welding them up. No, you can't. No, that's true. It's Tuesday the 1st of October the day Fred died. By late afternoon, the weather was becoming blustery. Fred made his usual call at the local shop for his evening paper. Two hours later, when Irena Grint and a friend brought their horses into the field, Fred was his usual cheery self. Hello, ladies. Hi there. Winter's coming early with a vengeance. I always found Fred very chatty, actually. He knew all the people around here. He'd seen children grow up. He knew three generations around here. See you in the morning. Yes, think so. Fred probably finished his work outside shortly before seven. Elm tea. <laughs> the gypsies swear by it. I bet they do. I bet they say, what the bloody hell Normally, he'd spend the evening at home watching the television, although he would often go out for a short stroll. Just after nine o'clock that night, a local resident saw Fred walking along Brant Road towards his front gate. That was the last time any of his friends or neighbours saw him alive. Half an hour after that, Caroline Banks had just called in at the Boundary Garage to buy some chocolate. As she crossed the road, she saw two men hanging around by the hedge near Fred's gate. At about the same time, Mick Cox was turning into Brant Road. I was travelling towards the new housing estate, up the Brant Road towards Wallington, and uh, from my right-hand side, two lads appeared. As Mick braked, a white Ford Capri had to swerve to avoid driving into him. 
Another witness remembers two men running down the path by the local doctor's surgery, heading towards a housing estate off Larne Road. It wasn't until the middle of the next day that a friend calling round to buy some vegetables realised something was seriously wrong. I'm sure I didn't. Are you there, Fred? Someone have picked it up. It's stolen the opal. Well, it, it's a possibility. Fred? Fred? Are you there? Fred? Fred? Are you there? Beverly. It's not. Well, it certainly didn't make its own way out of here. Had to be Pam. Now, you're going to have to go and front her about it. And as soon as possible... Well, Stuart Clifton, how had Fred been killed and why? Well, it was a particularly horrific killing. Mr Maltby had been killed with an axe, and despite extensive searches of the local area and the River Witham, which runs nearby, we failed to find it. The motive for the murder is a little unclear. The only thing that seems to be missing from Mr Maltby's home is a wallet, similar to this one, which would contain only a small amount of money, perhaps no more than £20. And it seems particularly horrific to kill a man of, of Mr Maltby's stature for such a paltry sum of money. He certainly didn't seem to have any enemies, did he? No, he didn't. What are the descriptions you have of the two men who were seen running away by several witnesses? Well, there are two witnesses that have compiled, uh, first, an e-fit that you can see, and secondly, the artist's impression. I should emphasise that both are of the same man. Um, he's described as about 18 to 25, about 5 feet 10 in height. He has light brown or mousy coloured hair, cut short on top and perhaps long in the collar. You'll see that one witness describes him with an earring and the other doesn't. You don't have such a good description of the second man? No, the second man, um, his description is very meagre, really. Uh, the witnesses only saw quite a fleeting glimpse of him. He again is in the same 18 to 25 age group, has dark hair and is of similar build. And you are satisfied, are you, that these two witnesses both saw the same two men? Yes, indeed. In fact, the, uh, the second witness saw the two men running across the uh, car park of the doctor's surgery opposite at around the same time, and they were running with some purpose. Now, what would the driver of that white Capri have seen? Well, he may have seen the two men. He certainly may be able to help us pinpoint the time, because Mr Cox is unclear about exactly what time it was that he saw the men. Uh, consequently, we may be able to piece together the story a little better with the second witness. Right, so we do need you, if you were the driver of that white Capri, to give us a ring. If you can help at all, I'll give you the numbers to call. If you can help Mr Clifton and his colleagues trace those two men or shed any light at all on why Mr Maltby was killed. You can speak to us now here in the studio on 081 811 8181 or contact the Lincolnshire Police Headquarters Direct on 0522 53 Lincolnshire where Fred Maltby was robbed and battered in his home. Fred Maltby was a quiet and self-contained man whose home was in a village just south of Lincoln. He'd lived in this farm cottage for 40 years and seldom ventured far afield. Property developers had once offered him half a million pounds for his 15-acre smallholding, and it's possible someone thought Fred was better off than he really was. On Tuesday, the 1st of October last year, at 9.45pm, a witness was driving home past Fred's house when he had to swerve to avoid two men running across the street. They were last seen heading towards a local housing estate on Larne Road. Since then, another man, Joe Rylett, has been killed, and the detective in charge of the case, Superintendent Stuart Clifton, has now linked the two inquiries. The victims lived about two miles apart, both were retired, both were thought to keep cash on the premises, both were attacked on Tuesday evenings, and both were killed in the same way. Joe Rylatt was divorced and lived alone in a flat above one of the two betting shops he'd started up in Lincoln. One of the shops was managed by his son, Eddie, and Alan had now more or less retired. He was shy, but charming, fond of poetry, of music, and of golf. And though he could be tough in business, among his friends he had a reputation for generosity, sometimes making loans of several thousand pounds. If your hands are apart, then you'll, then you'll slice it for sure, okay? 
Twice a week or so, Joe would walk just round the corner to St Botolph's Court, which is sheltered accommodation for old people. His mum has lived here for several years. Ah, oh, Joe. The last time she was to see him was the night he died, Tuesday the 28th of January. He was with her till around 8.30. <laughs> Meanwhile, opposite Joe's shop in High Street, a security guard noticed someone waiting. There may be nothing sinister in this, but a man was sitting in a red or orange C-registered Astra. Do you know who it was? He honked the horn and waved at someone. At about 8.25, another witness came across another car in Bargate. I noticed a brown escort car, and I saw a man stood at the driver's side door uh, with fair to mousy coloured hair, about 5 foot 10, 5 11 tall, with uh, green mountain boots or Wellingtons on. Uh, now. Before he left, Joe saw his mother's care assistant. She was the last person known to have seen him before he died. You're off now, then? Yeah, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't made her anything to eat. No, oh, that's all right. I'm just going for a, a while. I'll be back about ten. I'll make her something, then. Oh, OK. Thank there you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And which... Someone else, though, was to speak to Joe that night. A friend who placed a flutter with him now and then. The two programmes with Ian returns from the England tour. Bill's tonight are Ian Hello, Alan. It's Mike. Yeah, fine, fine. Yeah, I'm dogging it tonight, yes, yes. Oxford, if that's OK. One, two, nine o'clock on, 50p reverse. Oh, I've caught you a bad time, have I? Yeah, OK, bye, bye. It wasn't a normal Alan, Mike telephone conversation in the sense that he was a little more hurried uh, there was noises in the background which I heard distinctly uh, ie banging uh, and also uh, voices and a little bit of laughter then at 10 to 9 I was walking down Bargate past Rylet's bookmakers and I saw a bloke crouch down in the side entrance he was wearing a suede jacket maybe leather did you see someone here as well? Upstairs, Joe had been preparing sandwiches. Clearly, something, or someone, had interrupted him. About 50 minutes later, another witness was crossing High Street, just opposite Joe Rylett's shop. And this woman saw them a little further down the road. I passed these two youths that were running wildly. They ran up St Catherine's. They had to run into the road to avoid two old ladies, and a car beeped to them. I had to stop at the traffic lights. When they got towards the lights, they shot out into the road again. A car had to sound his horn and avoid them. I passed them just going past the St Catherine's garage on Newark Road, and that was the last time I saw them. Did you also see them? Or were you in one of the cars that swerved out to avoid them? Joe Rylat's safe was open. £3,000 was missing. Next morning, when Joe's son, Eddie, arrived to open up the shop, he found his father lying dead with severe wounds to his head. Stuart Clifton, murder is, is rare. For a man to kill twice successively is very rare. But for two men to kill in successive episodes, is, it's almost unheard of. It's certainly unheard of in, in Lincolnshire. Two murders that are so similar in the space of four months 
causes me to worry a great deal. I'm worried that this may develop into yet another murder, may develop into a serial killing. Because of that, uh, I'm using Crime Watch to appeal to the public of Lincoln. I believe that there are two people concerned in these murders, that perhaps only one has done the killing, and perhaps the second one has felt the need to tell somebody about it. Tonight, I appeal to that person to come forward and contact me through Crime Watch so that we can prevent another tragedy occurring. You think it's as serious as that? I do believe that there is the potential for another murder. I'm quite hopeful that someone in Lincoln will take the time and trouble tonight to ring us in the studio so that we can uh, prevent yet another serious incident occurring. Now, they make quite an odd couple, these two, don't they? Yes, they do. The, the, one, one is rather large, a little over six foot, and the other's quite small. The, uh, the bigger of the two is described as a skinny build. He's got mousy coloured hair, and he wore a corduroy coat, something similar to this. And one of the points of appeal I'd like to get over tonight is if anybody in the city of Lincoln knows anyone who fits the description that I've just given, who wears a coat of this type, then I would encourage them to ring me urgently in the studio tonight. They don't have to give their name. The smaller guy was wearing uh, distinctive clothing too in, the, in as much as white, vivid white shoes, trainers or something. Yes, the smaller man had a bomber jacket on. He's about five foot six with dark hair, again in his mid-twenties. He had uh, dark trousers and white training shoes, which looked as if they may be in new condition. Now, obviously, people living in Lincoln uh, are going to be fairly concerned about what you've said. Perhaps we should make it clear that they seem to be, firstly, acting uh, only at quite long distances in time, one from another, secondly, going for quite specific targets, but perhaps there are also things that people can do to protect themselves. Well, yes, of course. Clearly, there are two people in Lincoln who are prepared to commit murder. We know that one is tall and one is, is quite short. If people are visiting and they fit that general description, then obviously the public must be, aw be aware of that. Um, I would not encourage anybody to, to let people into their houses uh, unless they're quite sure of the people that they've got at their door. And if people have got suspicions about somebody who might be the killer, you suspect that person will have what characteristics that people might recognise apart from being or yes, I, I'm fairly confident that there will be one dominant personality in this, one killer perhaps. And that killer will be known in the city of Lincoln for his extreme violence. So I'd appeal for people in, in the city of Lincoln who know people that fit this description and who do show these violent traits to contact us here in the studio tonight. Well, please ring straight away. The urgency is pretty self-evident. 081-811-818. BBC One insight into a police investigation with murky detail. Nick Ross opens another case from the Crime Watch file. When Crime Watch viewers solve a murder, the decisive help is often indirect. Not as obvious as a name or an address, but just a little piece of evidence that turns out to be crucial. And that's what happened here in Lincoln. Three people came across something which under normal circumstances they would have disregarded. But two weeks earlier, they'd watched an appeal on Crime Watch.
Are you there, Fred? Fred? Someone saw Fred going into his gate at about 9 p.m. That's the last sighting we have, as far as we can tell. Mm. And the pathologist puts the time of death between 4 p.m. and 2 a.m. Yes, but he was still in his day clothes. He hadn't got ready for bed yet. Right, well, let's concentrate on all sightings between 9 o'clock and, say, midnight. Any sign of a weapon yet? Chris and Russell are onto it. Good. We'll get the house to house up and running. Let's try and get a handle on a motive. Andy, let's get on with this house to house. Yes, I think both Gordon Reedman and I were fairly horrified when we actually saw the amount of violence that poor old Fred Maltby had been subjected to, and the attack on him was, was quite horrendous. Um, uh, and I, I, I think that, that we actually paused and began to wonder what it was that we were going to be dealing with because, because of that extreme violence. It, it was so unnecessary against a man of that age. You do feel all sorts of emotions, uh, disgust, anger, hate, all those things do go through you but it's important that you soon put them to one side and get on with the job. If you need me, you can contact me at this address. Or... He was a very quiet man, was Fred. Private. He'd always lived alone. Was he well off, do you know? Oh, I shouldn't think so. I mean, he had a bit of land, I suppose, but it was too much for him to work anymore. He just used to sell a bit of fruit and veg from his garden shed. He always had a friendly word for you. Always the gentleman. Can you think of any reason why someone might want to kill Mr. Maltby? He was an old man. And he wasn't big. He couldn't hurt anyone. Fred was a... a quiet likeable man fairly shy but uh, when you got to know him he was a very good friend a good friend to me i would call him my best friend and uh, well when he's your best friend it leaves a big gap We we'll make an inquiries about a very serious assault on the chap that lives here. Do you know him? Yes. Where do you live? I live next door. Is that just there? Okay. okay. Well, in the house, there was blood staining uh, throughout the room in which he'd been killed. But on a cushion in the chair, there was an outline in blood of an axe. Uh, and it appeared on the cushion in two or three different places, as if the offender had put the axe down and perhaps even wiped it on, on the cushion before taking it away. Right, sir. Well, I, w I was driving home along Brant Road, yes. past Fred Maltby's farm, when these two young blokes just dashed right out in front of me. I nearly hit them. Going like the clappers they were, down the passageway by the side of the doctor's surgery. I mean, it was a rainy night, and no one wants to be hanging around on a night like that. Mm -hmm. But these two were definitely in a real rush to get somewhere. Do you think you might be able to help us put together some pictures of these men? I don't know about the second lad, but uh, the first one, yeah, I'll have a go. <laughs> Right, yeah. Here, where was you Tuesday? I thought you said you was going down the crow's nest. Me and Steve was uh, otherwise engaged, weren't we? Yeah. What? Was you doing a job? I could say that. In fact, I'd say we uh, done him pretty good, wouldn't you? <laughs> Hello. I'd like to speak to somebody about the murder, please. 
Yes. Um, I don't know if it'll be any help, but they're these two blokes. Yeah. OK, love, we'll take a look at them. No, d don't worry, they won't know it was you who called. All right, thanks. Bye for now. I think we might have something here, sir. Gary Bryant fits the description. Girl just phoned to say he's been mouthing off about the murder with another lad, Steve Webster. Oh, yeah, they're familiar faces. Bring them in, let's see what they've got to say for themselves. Bryant and Webster were known to the police. They were nuisance value, low-rate criminals. Often came to our notice for minor things. Bryant was seen in that area carrying a suspicious package. The day after, Fred Mulby's murder. Off Piss off! Yeah, they're just putting the suspect in the vehicle now. You all right, lads? Yeah, Keith's inside, and uh, I'm just approaching the building myself. Stephen Webster, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Fred Maltby. You do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Yeah. You're all right. Well, I think that will do. All right. That's it? Yeah. I told you, it was just some old tools. My bike was off the road and my mate had lent me some spanners and stuff. It didn't look like spanners to our witness. It looked like one single heavy object. How will our eyes need testing? I'm telling you, it was some old spanners. So why were you walking down by the river through Fred Maltby's land with this load of spanners? It's a shortcut. Everyone knows it. I'm now showing you item RH5, the left foot trainer. Is this yours, Gary? Yeah. What's this stain, then? Dirt. You're not looking, Gary. Looks like blood to me. OK, so it's blood. Dropped something on my foot. Like an axe, maybe. We had to release Steve Webster because we had nothing further on him. Tell him to come up, see what he's got. Tell him not to bother with that bloody rubbish. Tell him to keep looking. All right, Gary, you may choose any way you like in the lineup. Do you understand? Yeah. Brian did admit bragging about the murder, but denied committing the murder. You'd like to walk up and down the line twice? Any news? No, no. Full time. Yes. OK. Picked out the I will son. <laughs> God. They couldn't be ruled out on blood. They couldn't be ruled out on their story. And they couldn't be ruled out because the witness had failed to pick them out. So, so they were still there hanging about all the time. All right. But for the time being, at any rate, we had to let Bryant go. All right, Joe. Hello, Tracy. 
Oh, you just missed your man. No, he didn't want me, ma'am. I was wondering if I could have a word with you, actually. OK, me dog. Um, why don't you come through? Cheers, Mind Jay. the step. What can I do for you, then? Oh, it's nothing, really. It's just that... Well, my dad's got this new video and he wants to know if you'd be interested in buying the old one. Oh, could be, yes. How old is it? Well, it's only a couple of years. He wouldn't be getting rid of it, only he wanted one of them double-speed ones, do you know what I mean? You put it outside? Yeah. Let's have a look at it. I'll let you out the back. Incident room, DCI Reedman. Hello, Bob. What? Yeah. Yeah, I know it. I'll be right there. Well, it'll have to be Wednesday at about 3.30. Hang on. That bastard that did Fred. He's done it again. Apparently, only his family ever called him that. Why, John Holmes? If you go through it to the office. Cheers, thanks, Terry. His customers knew him as Joe for some reason. Honest Joe, the bookie, I suppose. I knew him by sight. He used to play golf over at Carham Road. <laughs> Quite a good handicap, I think. We were terribly sorry that he'd taken a second murder to give us a second chance, so to speak. But, but we saw it as that, a second chance. <laughs> Fred Maltby, Joe Rylett. Both elderly men living on their own, both murdered on a Tuesday night. No sign of forced entry in either case, so they probably both knew the killer. And yet again, we have witnesses putting two lads running away from the scene. But what links them conclusively is their injuries. Now, obviously, the PATH report will give us more on them. But Gordon and I have seen Joe, and frankly, it could have been Fred lying there. The head injuries were identical. But it looks like we could have more to go on with Joe than with Fred. Good. Yes, Joe Rylett was a very different kettle of fish to Fred Maltby. We're not short of motives for Joe, unlike poor old Fred. We could have something on that, boss. It seems the developer, Henry Boot, offered Fred a quarter of a million for his land a couple of years ago. It all fell through when the property market crashed, but uh, somebody might not have known that. Mm. Of course, Joe was a very well-known Lincoln face. I dare say some of you had a flutter or two with him yourselves. <laughs> but um, he wasn't just a bookie. He cashed cheques for people, lent money. Now, maybe someone didn't want to pay him back. And his safe was open with £3,000 missing from it. So let's round up all Joe's debtors, <clears throat> get on to banks and building societies, ask around, see if someone suddenly started throwing their money around. Oh, Dick, get those two scrotes, Bryant and Webster, back in. Right, sir. Yeah. So, hey, now, why does your mum know where you are? Straight in. Quick, you're 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 in. Quick, you you where were you on Tuesday then, Gary? I'll give you three guesses. At the Bally, in the Nick. I have to report in every day under my bail conditions. You bastards kept me there all evening. 
Well, you can't get a much more watertight alibi than the fact that he's locked up in a police station. So from that point on, we were able to eliminate Bryant and Webster. That meant that we then had to concentrate our efforts on those things which may be fruitful. Did your brother charge interest? No. Never chased people up if it was under 150 quid or so. Really used to have a go at him sometimes for it. I mean, he was far too trusting. He could be a stubborn old bugger sometimes. Just used to tell me to mind my own business. So, uh, did you know all these people you used to lend to? Yeah, most. Can you give us their names? Oh, well, I don't know where to begin. Uh, let's see, there was... Um, Tom Marwick, uh, Dennis Smalley, uh, Malcolm Storning. Malcolm who? Storning. Storning, yeah. Vic Chant, uh, Peter Smith. Alan was like a father to me. He was uh, 16 years older than I was. And uh, when our father died, I was five years old and Alan would be 21. And he was like a surrogate father to me. Um, he was a private man. Um, quite a shy man and uh, not the sort of man you would associate really with a bookmaker being a bookmaker yeah Joe was always very good to me there's never anything dodgy about it or nothing just used to help me out every now and then did you ever go over to his shop yeah well around the back of the shop like right? it's the office he had there how much do you reckon you've had off him then over the years <sighs> was only over 100 150 quid at a time and I always paid him back Drawing money now? No. It's, uh, haven't seen him since, oof, must be over a month. Well, not last Tuesday night? No. Well, what were you doing last Tuesday? It was a uh, very foggy night, if that helps jog your memory. Yeah. Well, I think I must have been at home. I uh, babysitting with the kids. We set a, a very firm policy that, that we would interview each of these people. But, it, but really, it's fair to say that it took us nowhere in the sense that although it identified a, a number of people, all of those people were alibied. Detective Chief Inspector Reedman. Well, I see forensic have been. Okay. And uh, you don't know who sold it to Joe? Sorry, um, Alan. It didn't say, just that he bought it off some bloke who came to the office. It was a man then? Yeah. Well, I suppose so. And when would that have been? Well, that's why I phoned. It must have been a couple of days before he was killed because, uh, yeah, a couple of days before he was killed. I thought I had something to do with it. Well, we'll take it in, see what they come up with. You never know. Cheers. Right, thanks. We traced the video recorder to a, a shop in Lincoln and found that it had been stolen from a house in the city about two weeks before Joe Rowlett's murder. How long was it, huh? I think it's 31. That was it? Oh. That's his car, I think. This one, 29. I think this will be it. Trevor Pope. Morning, Trevor. Long time no see. How's your girlfriend? Trevor Pope was interesting to us because he had convictions for burglary and assault, and his girlfriend's mother worked for Joe Rylett in the shop. Lincoln police station. The time according to the interview room clock is 4.43 p.m. and it's Monday the 3rd of February 1992. I am Detective Sergeant Dick Holmes. I'm Detective Constable John Taylor. Would you like to identify yourself? Tracy Palmer. Look, I don't know why you've got me here. I don't know nothing about Joe's murder. Let's just take things one at a time, shall we? What about the video? 
What video? Come on, Tracy. The video your boyfriend Trevor nicked and you fenced to Joe Ryland. No fence. It was my dad's video. Trev didn't know nothing about it. Okay, Trevor, you don't have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you say may be given in evidence. You understand that? Right, Trevor. Tracy's told us she sold that video to Joe. So? So we think you nicked it out of that house you were renting. But we're not bothered by your usual sordid habits. This is murder. Something go wrong, eh? Did you go back to Joe's shop for more and he caught you at it? Talk to us, Trevor. Talk to you. No chance, mate. At the end of the day, she was charged with handling the stolen video and we weren't able to take the matter against Pope any further. Stop it, Simon, or we're going home now. And Mario know all the Coopers. Don't start that again. Well, Dad, why can't I have Nintendo? You know why. We can't afford it. But Paul's got one and he's getting a Sega for his birthday. I know. It'll we'll be next year, eh? Well, come on, finish off these last bits and then we'll get off home. Bloody ducks. Okay, right, that's it. Come on. Paint? What, what kind of paint? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you think you'll be of any help, yeah, see what he has to say about it. Oh, Gordon, have you got a minute? There were tiny fragments of a substance embedded in the wounds of Joe Rylett, and the lab were now in a position to tell us that that was paint. There, you see? The flame changing colour like that tells us it's a paint with a very high zinc content. But with fragments this small, I really can't tell you any more than that. What use would it have? Probably a primer, used for rust-proofing metal. So it's fairly specialised, then? Afraid not. I'd say this stuff is available in factories and DIY superstores, from Bogna to Balakulish. Oh! Somewhere in the east of England, two small-time robbers have been engaged in a partnership that's led so far to at least two violent deaths. You may recall a murder reconstruction we did three months ago in Lincolnshire, where Fred Maltby was robbed and battered in his home. Fred Maltby was a quiet and self-contained man whose home was in a village just south of Lincoln. We went to Crime Watch because we thought that the running men may be identified what he'd actually do was to open up a complete new line of inquiry that we really hadn't envisaged. Sure. I can't. Oh, what would you give me if I swam as late? Nothing. If you swam as late? No, no, nothing really. Hey guys, look at this. What? Look! What's that in it? Don't know. And to all guys that were murdered, that was an axe. It was on the telly. Yeah, it's really gonna be that one, isn't it? It might be. So what are we gonna do with it? Don't get your prints on it. Here, give me your scarf. <laughs> Come on, I need it. What are you gonna do? Sorry. 
bit of good news, boss. Some lads have just handed in what looks like our murder weapon. Found it on an island in the middle of Booting Park Boating Lake. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah, looks good to me. OK, we'll get forensics onto it right away. Shall I tell the press office to put out a release on it? Uh, no, no publicity for the moment. Let's see what we've got. When the axe was found, it gave the enquiry a new focus. There was little doubt it was the murder weapon because the lab found traces of Joe Rylett's blood on it. They also said it probably, though not conclusively, left the mark on Fred Maltby's cushion. And perhaps most interestingly of all, it had been painted with a grey paint which appeared to match the fragments in Joe Rylett's wounds. There were no fragments of paint in Fred Maltby's head. So the indications were that the murderer had painted it between the two murders, probably to cover up what he thought may be on it, i.e. the blood of, of Fred Maltby. Don't get your hopes up. I still can't tell you what your paint is. But I might be able to narrow down the field for you. Anything will help. First of all, the zinc in it isn't new. It's reconstituted. But better, from your point of view, I've identified the binding agent, the stuff that holds it together. It's a rather unusual resin called epoxy ester D4. How unusual? Well, I've done a bit of research, and the good news is that only one factory makes it. And the bad? Twofold, really. A, the factory's in Essen, in Germany. B, they distribute the resin to paint manufacturers all over Europe. How big did you say our foreign travel budget was? Step for all the neighbours to see. Uh, what did you tell them? Oh, don't worry, I got rid of them. Again. But that's the last time, Dennis. You've got to get them off our backs somehow. Dennis, ready! Dennis! Where are you going? Guten Tag. We're führen in Lincoln, England, eine Marktuntersuchung. It was crucial that we find out as much as we could about this paint. And so I led a team of officers across into Germany and we made inquiries there and at a number of paint manufacturers in Holland, Belgium and France. We were obtaining samples of their paints and these were being examined by forensic scientists at Huntingdon. Do you use epoxy ester D4? Yes. And do you also use reconstituted zinc? Uh, Your paint is zinc-based, grey primer, and you export no, it no, to England. No, 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 uh, it is not grey, it is white. We export to England with white paint. White. After several weeks of painstaking work, the lab were finally able to identify the paint on the axe. It was a spray paint called Rust-Oleum 2185. Rust-Oleum is a Dutch-based company who use uh, British import agents that are based in, in the Midlands. Yeah, we're really just interested in the outlets in the Lincoln area. It's like I said off the top of my head, I wouldn't know, but I'll check for you. Okay. We were able to trace the Midland distribution network and in fact we discovered that there was only one firm in Lincoln that actually took Rust-Oleum in and that was a, a firm called Hike and Florum Supplies. I bet he's going to tell us they sell this stuff all over the bloody country. Mm. Mr Foster. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, you gentlemen want to see our stock of Rust-Oleum? That's all right. Yeah, well, it's just over here. There you go. Is that all of it? Haven't you sold any? 
We were sent 36 tins this year. We got this 12 left. Sold the rest. Where to? Well, you come with me, I'll show you. All of it to here? All 24 cans? <laughs> Don't believe it. After we traced the uh, distribution network of Rustolium, our inquiries led us into a local company, specialist heat exchanges, who employ less than a couple of hundred people. So we'd suddenly gone from 100,000 suspects, that being the, the population of Lincoln, down to less than 200 who would have access to this paint. And so we began to look at each and every one of the people that were employed there. <laughs> Seems they want to know about the paint we use. <laughs> oh. Here's a name that rings bells. Dennis Granville Smalley. Yeah. No, thanks. Actually, I was just wanting a quick word with you. Go on. You can see my car from your window there, can't you? Yes, about so, if I look. Can you remember if I went out in it a couple of Tuesdays ago? Sorry, mate. If you don't know whether you did or not, I'm hardly likely to, am I? Uh, no, of course not. Ah, sorry, mate. Just a thought. Dennis Smalley, one of the specialist heat exchange employees, was the only person that had figured before in the inquiry because he'd borrowed money from Joe Rylett. And because of that, he became very interesting from that moment on. Yes. Dennis has worked here ooh, seven years, I think. Never had any problems. It's a good attendance record. Until his accident. Accident? Car accident. Him and his wife and kids. It was quite serious. How long ago was that? Oh, about five years ago. He was off work for about eight months or so. What about this paint, Rustolium? We know you use it at work. Would Dennis take any of it home with him? Well, yeah. I mean, the management turned a blind eye. It's a perk, really. Everyone takes a bit here and there. What for? Just for odd touching up jobs. If your car's a bit rusty or whatever. What kind of bloke is Dennis? Nice enough. Doesn't mix much, but that's all right. Crazy about his kids. Always talking about them. That and shooting. Mm. What kind of shooting? Clay pigeon, I think. I'm not much interested in it myself. Big bloke, Dennis, isn't he? Does he ever throw his weight around? No, never. Look, if you're trying to pin these murders on him, forget it. Dennis just isn't the type. He's, well, placid, I suppose is the word. Sort of gentle giant. Now, when we talked to you before, Dennis, you said that on Tuesday the 28th of January, you were at home babysitting, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, my, my wife works evenings at Asda, so... I look after the kids. When do they go to bed? Usually about nine. Uh, sometimes I let Anna stay up reading while half past. She's a little so and so for reading, is Anna. And your wife gets back when? Ten past, quarter past ten. One of your mates told us you mentioned you knew Fred Maltby. Is that right, Dennis? Twenty-five years ago. It, just after I left school, a mate and I worked Saturday mornings for him. They stopped there about, uh, what, five, six months? Just and, helping out the farm. Sorry. And when did you last see him? Well, that were it. 25 years ago. I was supposed to be at work half an hour ago. But I hope you're going to put them things back when you finish with them. Don't worry, love. Of course we will. I don't believe this. Will you be careful of that? Yeah. Look, I don't know 
know what you're looking for, but you're not gonna find it. Application for firearms license. DG Smalley. Intended venue for shooting. Land belonging to Fred Maltby. Thanks, Renata. Will you do me a copy yeah, of that? Yeah, sure, John. No problem. Tell us. Morning, love. Dick Holmes, Lincolnshire CID. Do you mind if I have a look at your visitor's book? Yeah, it's OK. Cheers. Good morning, specialist. Who takes changes? I'll just try this extension for you. You can get to the river down this path, can't you? Yeah. And beyond the river would be Fred Maltby's farm. Is it walkable from here, would you say? Yeah, there's a bridge just along the way. It should take about half an hour or so. Hey, Fletch. Yeah, we've got a couple of mail receipts there. Worth keeping. Dennis Smalley, 27th of January, Joe Rylett. What about Joe Rylett then? How well did you know him? Well, I wouldn't say we were a mate like. He used to cash checks for me every once in a while. And then uh, the other two times I borrowed a bit off him. How much? Last time, it was 110 quid for my car insurance. Is that why he came to see you at your workplace the day before he was murdered? Yeah. Yeah, I paid him off. It was all square. But, Dennis, we know Joe never used to chase up debts that small. He wouldn't have bothered, not unless it was hell of a sight more than 110 quid, unless it was more like thousands. Uh, no, no, I, I never owed Joe that much. We think you did. And Joe was hassling you for it, wasn't he? No. No, it was all square. You owe money to other people too, don't you? Well, banks and that, yeah. Yeah, we've been speaking to them. You've been following left, right and centre. Well, times have been hard since my accident. Uh, I never got all the compensation I should have. In fact, by our calculations, you owe something in the region of £27,000. Stop my money completely after a while. You've been robbing Peter to pay Paul. They've all been hassling you. Debt collectors, cheques bounced. We know all about it. Well, I had to borrow money to keep my head above water. And yet, on the 31st of January, you were able to pay off £750 by registered post. That's three days after Joe Rylett was murdered. And there were other debts you suddenly paid off, too. Now, I want you to listen to me, Dennis. Yeah? We've had an accountant compile a report on your financial situation, and he tells us that by the end of February, you'd paid off nearly £2,000. Yeah, well, what that was was my Uncle Jack died, and he had one of them, um, uh, what you call it, them timeshare things. And I got nearly £900 from that. Joe? had £3,000 in his safe, and you were desperate. I wouldn't stoop to a thing like that, if I was in debt up to my neck. But you were in debt up to your neck, Dennis, weren't you? You were drowning, mate. For the benefit of the tape, it is 11.28 a.m., and Detective Constable Taylor has entered the interview room. It is now 11.29 a.m. and I intend to conclude the interview. I just thought you ought to know, boss. House to House have come up with a woman who lives across from Smalley who says he definitely went out that night. Well, can't she be sure if it was the night of Joe's murder? Oh, she's adamant. She was worried about his kids being left on their own. She'd mentioned it to her mum on the phone. Great. Well, let's leave it for a bit. Let him have his dinner. Mm. No, 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 I, I never leave my children on their own. Never. Well, we have a witness who's prepared to swear that you left your house at a quarter to eight that night and you didn't return until two hours later. Well, I love my children. I couldn't. And during those two hours, Joe Rylett was murdered. Well, I was at home. Oh, you're lying, Dennis. Just like you lied about Fred Maltby. We know you shot on his land. Uh, I never. 
I applied to, but I never did. I only ever shot down the club. Do you know booting park boating late, Dennis? Yeah. When was the last time you were there? Eh, uh, middle of last year. I took the kids. Not since. No. No. To feed the dogs. And then that were around the other side. You seem very other side sure of what? Hang on, hang on. That was around the other side of what? Dennis, the other side of what? Well, uh, when I was there the other day, I saw there were a police car there. And that were around the other side. Of the lake. We had not released by the media the precise location of where the axe had been found. Now, the only people who would have known where the axe had been found were the three lads and the murderer. We were charged with the offences shown below. You do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Aye. Right. At Lincoln, between the 30th of September 1991 and the 3rd of October 1991, did murder Fred Maltby, contrary to common law. Do you understand? Right. At Lincoln, between the 27th of January 1992 and the 30th of January 1992, did murder Norman Allen Rylett, contrary to common law. Do you understand? That's right. All right, just like so at the bottom. Smalley had no alibi. He knew both victims, he had a strong motive, and he had access to the paint which was found on the axe. We now had a very strong case against him. Members of the jury, on the count of the murder of Alan Rylett, do you find the accused? Dennis Granville Smalley, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Well, after the trial, it was just uh, a huge relief. And, uh, and I suppose it's just a question of, uh, like my mother used to say, life is, is not picking up a good hand, it's picking up a bad hand and playing it well, and we'll try and play it the best as we can. On the count of the murder of Frederick Maltby, do you find the accused guilty? or not guilty? Guilty. Having got the man, it's not going to make any difference to Fred. We're not going to see Fred again. I think that's sort of uppermost in your mind, really, regardless of what happens to, to Danny Smalley. I think he probably got himself into such a dire financial position that he couldn't see any way out of it. How can you feel sympathy when two relatively old men have been killed for no real reason? You can't feel any sympathy for him, can you? What are you doing, Joe? Joe? What? I knew Dennis Smalley. We grew up together. Um in St. Peter's Avenue in Lincoln. He was a couple of years older than me. I do remember one occasion when uh, we went down to Booton Park. There's a lake there, and we undid the uh, lock and almost drained the lake. I couldn't imagine Dennis committing a crime like this. He appeared harmless. I never, ever think about Dennis Morley now at all. I just don't think about him at all. If Dennis Smalley had actually thrown that axe and it had missed the island, if he'd thrown it with more or less force, had it gone in the water and the axe hadn't been recovered, then I'm sure that, that we would have never actually got to the bottom of these two murders. <laughs>